Welcome back, everyone, to theCUBE's coverage here in New York City for the AWS Summit. This is theCUBE's exclusive coverage. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE. We're here with VJ, field CTO at Scale AI, hot company, uh, is growing great. Great to have you on theCUBE. Thank you, yeah, really excited to be here. So we met um, yeah, your CEO, I think at Dell Tech World, another event. Mm -hmm. You guys have been growing fast. Take a minute to explain what Scale AI does first for people who don't know what you guys are doing. Yeah, it's definitely. It's been a great success story, go yeah. ahead. Alexander Wang, our CEO, he started the company eight years ago. Even from the early days of Scale, we were recognized as a leader in building trustworthy AI systems. Um, so some of the first use cases we tackled were self-driving and autonomy. Um, how do you make sure that a self-driving car stops at a crosswalk, if a pedestrian crosses a crosswalk? And the key insight that Alexander brought to bear is this idea of data-centric AI. Um, if you find the right data that can help you reach that safety milestone, you know, examples of pedestrians, maybe people um, on bicycles crossing that crosswalk, that data is worth its weight in gold for training the AI model and hitting that safety to milestone in three months or six months instead of waiting nine or 12 months to get there. Um, so we, you know, we took this approach for computer vision, for LiDAR, for all these cases. Um, and then we ended up partnering with some cutting edge research labs. One of them was a little startup known as OpenAI. Um, and so running up, they had GPT-3 and we were partnering with them on this data workflow called reinforcement yeah. learning. Um, that ended up powering ChatGPT, which was one of the first gen AI mm -hmm. workflows where human beings can interact with the model and reliably get certain answers and ask the model to mm -hmm. follow instructions and expect those instructions to be obeyed. Reinforcement learning is a key piece of making that possible. Um, so today we kind of have three big buckets of customers. Um, one or the open AIs of the world, the research labs that are building the next cutting edge models. Mm -hmm. We're helping make those models more trustworthy across a range of new capabilities like writing code or doing mm -hmm. multimodal data. Um, and the second uh, is really one of the most interesting ones. It's enterprises, private companies mm -hmm. that are actually adopting Gen AI. They have really unique needs because they have private data. They have data that needs to be kept you know, in a VPC in Stockholm or in a VPC on the East Coast. I mean, it can't leave the bounds there. Or if it does, there has to be really strict role-based access control around how that data is used, even if you have derived data from that data. So making Gen AI work in that environment has been a big challenge. Challenge, and we've built this Gen AI platform around that. Um, and then the third big bucket of customers is the public sector. Um, we have a range of agent-driven workflows. That it's called Agent Donovan, but it helps people with really mission-critical objectives accomplish their work by talking to a commander in the way that they expect to be talked to. Give an example of Donovan real quick. Yeah, a great example would be if you're in an agency and you have a supply chain issue and you ask you know, a model, find me all the warehouses around Chicago that could help solve this problem in the next six hours. Um, with the model today, you might get a block of text as an answer. You might say, hey, here's five different cities and yeah. some of those might be accurate, some of those might be from the wrong data. Um, but what Agent Donovan does is it actually gets the breakdown answer, it verifies each one of those using multiple models in the loop, and then rather than just giving you a block of text, it'll actually go and plot it out on a map and show you the links in the chain of that supply chain so that you can visually understand as someone you know, that, that's the responsible individual for the supply chain, this is where I can make changes, this is something I can do the next 10 minutes to actually mm -hmm. drive an outcome. Um, that ends up being really important in timely mission critical objectives. Um, so we're using across a range of the U.S. government. Um, the Department of Defense has an office called the CDAO, the Chief Digital AI Officer. Um, they're one of the first to use our models across a range mm -hmm. of different use cases. Um, but we're evaluating Gen AI with that lens. You know, how can you actually drive actions rather than than just up? So how actions? do you keep up? How do you stay up at night? You don't get any sleep with all that action going on. You got the open AIs provide, I call the hyperscale AIs. Yeah. The hyperscale AIs, so maybe not the right term, but the big AI providers. Yep. You got just in general the enterprise is a wide open thing in public sector. Yeah, I mean you guys got a lot of business going on. Here. Definitely, yeah. It's been a yeah. break like two years. But one interesting thing, you know, I, I think the pace of innovation on the that hyperscaler side has been so fast. They've been adding new capabilities like multimodal capabilities or the ability to do voice outputs that just weren't there a year ago. Um, enterprises have been kind of struggling to keep mm -hmm. up. And one challenge we've seen is, you know, if you talk to some of these companies last year, they maybe had a hundred mm -hmm. different prototypes of Gen AI applications. They were just getting off the ground. Maybe each team that understood mm -hmm. its data really well, they had their own data silos. Yeah. They would build a Gen AI application against their database and mm -hmm. they would just have it plug in there. And they're realizing this year that there are two big bottlenecks to actually making that drive ROI. Um, one is trustworthiness of the answers. You know, if the model can't get the right data from the right part of the organization, it just can't give a reliable answer. If it doesn't have the most latest research reports I've written on Apple or NVIDIA as a stock, and you're giving research reports based on 10 years ago, you're going to be talking about GPUs used for gaming or you know, yeah, the exactly. iPhone 9. Um, yeah. That's a big problem if you're talking yeah. to a customer. So stale customer. data and hallucinations are a big factor in, in those lack of or gap data gaps. Exactly. That's called data gaps or yeah. whatever people call it's it. It's a model understanding where to get the right data, how to execute SQL or other analytics languages in order to access that data, and then understanding when it doesn't just have the data that needs to answer a question, and telling a human operator, hey, I don't have access to the right you data. You mentioned the LiDAR example. I want to dig into that, because I think you, this is where it comes down to where I get excited by some of the coolness of this. Mm -hmm. Okay, I know what a bicycle looks like in the bike lane in San Francisco, Waymo's there, I'm powering Waymo. Yep. I'll store that, because that's important to me, because I got to know that image. Yep. Okay, I'll store that, I see some people walking around, okay, get that. That's not real-time information, that's historical data. Yep. 
you mentioned the staleness. You got to keep feeding fresh information into the model totally. to yeah. keep it fresh. Yeah. So there's a freshness date, it's like the Budweiser, that don't open after this date kind yeah. of thing. Um, but that's fact. So you've got historical data. You know, this is important, what to keep track of. What is, how do you guys look at that? How should people think about that? Because now they're getting all this data access. So unstructured data is piling up like, a, like you read about. Yeah. SQL data is almost a system of record kind of context. Right. But similar with that, I got a bicycle, I need to store that. Yeah, yeah. And I have this real time streaming data coming in. What do I do? Yeah, you need constant 24 seven online evaluation of Gen AI applications, which, which is a new mindset that people didn't have before. You know, in the past, if you wanted to evaluate a model, and let's say a model is a legal model that's going to summarize a legal document for you, you'd go and find your lawyer, your in house lawyer, you'd say, hey, did this model give the right output? <laughs> um, what sort of feedback do you want to give the model so I can improve the prompt or some other part of the application? But really, what you need is 24 seven. If people are asking legal questions and they're your employees, um, you need to have a range of different scenarios that you're testing mm -hmm. and you're observing and you're seeing how the model's changing over time. Um, a great example, if you're a multinational corporation, the laws in Switzerland and Germany are very different, even though customers were going to ask uh, in German about mm -hmm. both those countries. So you want to make sure just asking in German doesn't mean you're defaulting <laughs> to German law. Um, you need online evaluation yeah. to make sure you're not breaking those. Um, without that, as your data architecture changes and these data pipelines are, are breaking down and assembling new ones, you're just going to run into new hallucinations because the data yeah. just isn't there to support. It's interesting. It's almost a false summit you're climbing if you think that's the answer if you don't rethink it because ultimately you think you're having success and all of a sudden, wait a minute, I'm way over my skis on this yeah, one. Yeah, definitely. I got to now go back and re-architect. So this is the fear everyone has in the enterprise. Yeah. And and that's, this is important. So I have to ask you, what do you do to solve that? So, um, you know, Matt Wood announced on stage models and will generate models. Okay. But we've been doing data marketplaces for over a decade. Yeah. So data exchanges have happened but model exchanges haven't happened. So yeah. if you don't have a model, you're not in pole position at all to pick compete. Totally, yeah. So what yep. do you do? Is it compete on models or what? Yeah, so models can be some of the most important IP that some of these organizations have, especially when you fine tune smaller models. Um, you can make those models really accurate against your business or the way you talk to customers. You can have a model that chats with customers in the right tone of voice. Um, but ultimately your real, you know, uh, your real milestone of how you measure your performance is, can you unlock your people? Can you unlock like all this organization expertise that I have and have them drive improvements over time. And ultimately, you can't hold any advantage that you can't observe. Mm -hmm. if, if you have an advantage in terms of your model being better, your data being yeah. better organized, if you can't observe that and demonstrate that through monitoring, yeah. um, you're just not going to hold that advantage. We were riffing earlier on the analyst session, I was saying to uh, Zias and Sarbjeet, who was here, that um, the entrepreneur equation 10 years, uh, 20 years ago was, wow, I'm going to disrupt this category by renting my house out, or I'll start this micro, my SMS app, or whatever it yeah. did. And I just put the credit card down and spin up some compute, rather than buying a server at Supermicro, and see if it worked, right? right? That was a SaaS, that was the way the iPhone generation happened, SaaS happened. Yeah. That is not long over the entrepreneurial case. The actual case now is, there's a complex app development environment that involves a lot of cloud. Right. The right. cloud was just emerging, Amazon just happened to be at the doorstep and the place where this is so awesome for entrepreneurship because yeah. the alternative is no risk. Right. So the zero risk, well, credit card risk, 50 bucks. Yeah. There's risk now because you have, totally. but, the, but the entrepreneurs are looking at the data models. Yeah. And I could flip a model out there and change a category. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, yeah. so you're saying is that if I'm doing data exchange the wrong way and I'm going down the path where there's going to be hallucinations, I'm, I'm at, I get to the wrong spot the technical debt is oh, killing you. Right, right. So I could come in and be a model developer and take over a category, yeah. potentially. I could totally you really, I, I worked at YouTube years ago and I remember the early days of YouTube, it was exactly that disruptor mindset. You can put down a credit card, you get a bunch of servers, you rack them up at Equinix and suddenly you're serving video traffic to millions of people around the country. Um, the world today is very different. So these foundation models, they require a easily $10 million, now $100 million of investment in data and infrastructure and and monitoring and observability in order to just get these models out the door. Um, but then once you leverage those models, there's a range of things you can do just based upon that initial investment that's just really powerful. Um, so we're seeing a lot of firms, and, and those firms that normally you'd be considered to be the ones to be disrupted, they're actually leading the way in figuring out how can I build these centers of excellence within my company, have really smart AI engineers and, and other stakeholders, maybe an AI ethics officer, collaborating together to see those opportunities forward. So we're seeing a lot of like really groundbreaking innovation happening in these regulated industries. Mm -hmm where data governance has always been part of the question, um, understanding the lineage of your data, understanding how mature that data is. These are just fundamental
fundamental parts of how they've done business for the last 10 years. And now they're applying that Gen AI stack on top of, of that. What about thing. the entrepreneurial activity? Where do you see that happening? Yeah, there a lot of interesting Given stuff. Given the high cost to do a model. It's, I mean, to be a consumer model, it's going to be like a high bar. Yeah, definitely. To but, do a consumer model, it requires a lot of investment. So there's only a few players in that space. Um, but there's a range of startups that are trying to do really interesting things based upon agents and other activity, um, really kind of building to the use case. So if you have a legal use case, let's make a model that talks to lawyers in the language that they need to be talked to. If you have an education use case, we've seen some really interesting investment there in ed tech where talk to students about where they are in the journey. You know, if someone doesn't understand photosynthesis, they're a first year college student, talk to them differently than the way you would someone who's already done organic mm -hmm. chemistry and knows like a range <laughs> yeah, of things yeah. you're not going to know. It's yeah. interesting. Yeah. You could be a domain specific expert, let's say legal, get a small little beach head feature. Yeah. And then end up aggregating data for the whole vertical. Totally. Potentially. Yeah. Right? I mean, I'm just making this up, but yeah. that could be a trajectory. Data is unbelievably valuable. But maybe the bigger use case for data is actually just evaluating how the models are doing today. Without the right data, you can't figure out how the models are performing. You can't move forward towards a goal. Um, so having the right data about how your specific use case, that's worth mm -hmm. its weight in gold right now. Yeah, like, data observability is a hot area. What's your view on that? Are we like, not there yet? Are some people doing it? Are you guys doing it? Totally. The first thing is you have to do it. You have to <laughs> have data observability. Like, your data is changing over time. You know, you're going to introduce bias. You're going to introduce yeah. data drift, all these yeah. issues if you're not observing your data. Data is the lifeblood of any GI application. Um, and applications are changing in how they retrieve mm -hmm. data over time. Um, we're starting to see this really important pattern that we do in financial services where the model writes the SQL and the SQL goes and executes and gets the data, and then it's transformed in a way that's useful to a human analyst. Mm -hmm. You could create a PowerPoint presentation or a chart mm -hmm. or a graph out of that data. Um, you need to understand how that SQL is executing. Mm -hmm. um, does it know about the schema of your database? Is that schema changing over time? If you don't do that, you have this incredibly brittle application that works today and doesn't work tomorrow. What's your yeah. big use case in the enterprise? If people watching here wants to scale AI, give you guys a look over. Yeah. What's the big use case that you guys are doing the most action with the enterprise? Definitely. Text to SQL is a big one. Um, it's very painful to have a data analytics org be the bottleneck for everyone else in the company. You know, if they want a question about how many customers bought hot dogs on 4th of July and you have to wait three weeks for a data analyst to write the SQL query, that's really painful. And so having models generate SQL and generate yeah. accurate and reliable SQL, it empowers the data analyst team. It's a force multiplier yeah. for them to do their work a lot. Well, the big yeah. models will tell you who won the Nathan's hot dog eating contest for sure. <laughs> we good. saw that on TV. Yeah. Um, Was it Kobayashi? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Let's put sidebar that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so that's cool. So this is important because this is now saves time. So the querying the SQL thing is going to be very key. Yeah. What's the fine tuning equation? Because I hear a lot of people ask questions. This is the most common question I get. What do, what, do, what, what do I do fine tuning? Tuning on. Yeah. My data is already trained. Well, I don't need to. What do I? And, and where does re reasoning and reinforced learning, when do that, does that apply? Yeah, absolutely. I don't know when to apply what to the data at what stage of wherever I'm, my journey is. Yeah. When you have those questions to customer, it's important to take a step back and figure out how do you evaluate what success is? And do you have the evaluations in place? We take this approach called hybrid evaluation, where you have models that are always going to be important in evaluating other models because they can do things that human beings just mm -hmm. can't do at scale. You know, a model can translate your question about the law in German to Swiss German and ask that same question and see if there's a different answer. Um, so that model assisted evaluation is important. But expert oversight is incredibly important as well. Bringing in all this knowledge that you have about the law or about biology and bringing that together at scale is incredibly important. But once you get that evaluation firm in place, then you can see what are the really important interventions I could do to make a difference this week. You know, mm -hmm. Is it fine tuning a model? Maybe that takes two to three weeks. Is it adding a new guardrail on top of the model? Maybe I can do that in an hour. Um, can I just change up the prompts? Um, without evaluations, you don't know if you're moving towards your goal and you don't know how far away that goal is. But once you do know that, you can figure out what are the different interventions I could do to try to get along that path. What's the advice you have for, for two, two, two use cases? One use case is you got a company who's got a small language model. Mm -hmm. It's fairly trans unique, so it's 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 okay. Um, what do I do with this model? What do I interact it with? Well, how do I engage another model? And then two mindset for organizations who want to bring in this new culture yeah. of thinking, yeah. systems thinking, prompt thinking, to start the trajectory of culture yeah. shift inside their organization. Totally. I mean, most models today in the enterprise are useless without data, and that's why there's this big story about data gravity when it comes to Gen AI. You can have a small model, and you could deploy it closer to where your data and where that compute lives. Um, that ends up being much more valuable than having a large model that can't access the right data because of access control procedures you have. Um, so we have lots of companies is where maybe for some l regulatory reason they have data that sits in a VPC in Stockholm and they have a separate set of data that sits in a VPC in Berlin and those two data sets shouldn't be conjoined together in order to answer.
answer a question, but you, you can answer independent questions about each one of them. You can have a smaller model that lives in those two different locations and is able to do a lot of uh, knowledge and reasoning about what's local to it. That ends up being incredibly valuable and unlocks a lot of opportunities for you as well. So VJ, what we're talking about here is essentially platform engineering for data. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, is that data engineering now? I mean, is there a category? What's your view on this? Because this is huge. I mean, this yeah. is a huge shift. I mean, it's a platform shift. Totally. I mean, you see that clearly on your company's living it, but yeah. other companies are just trying to grok platform engineering with Kubernetes and cloud native. Now I'm like, what? I got to reset my entire data analytics stack? Right, right. Well, that's not my department. And the first thing that Jenny and I <laughs> did, even five years ago, was start to unlock the value of unstructured data. You know, before if you had research reports, it's really hard to make sense of them or put them in a database and retrieve them. You can unlock all that value. But now we're seeing, you know, even structured data, you're able to unlock all this value by understanding the data silos in your organization and finding ways to answer questions securely mm -hmm. against that data. Um, according across, like, maybe if you're a large bank and you've acquired 15 regional banks in the last 10 years, each of those might store customer data on different databases. Now you can build data pipelines that answer questions about your entire business mm -hmm. in a way that you just couldn't possibly do before. Um, so we, we, we see a lot of value in that. It, these, this data platform's being built in part because you have this new tool that yeah. suddenly unlocks yeah. all this value. Yeah. It's interesting, you know, I see a couple of different use cases as we do talk to our, our, our research team in the cube. <laughs> a couple of scenarios I want to run by and get your reaction. One is, Here's an environment that is completely not positioned for Gen AI. They're just old legacy. They never invested. They outsourced it to the hilt. Yeah. They got some token projects that look good. Then you got the uh, companies that are actually doing really well in the modern DevOps factor, but don't yet have that data connected. Right. And then the ones that are actually investing. Yep. Okay, let's talk about the, the first two. Um, this is where you start getting into, okay, you need a full retrofit. Yeah, it's like a like the bar takeover uh, show. It's like okay, shut it down. We're going to reopen in two two months or whatever that is. Yeah, they have to re-architect their entire thing because now um, they have legacy storage, networking, and compute, mm -hmm. and the Gen AI apps that they want to do will have to train. We'd be different characteristics. I might need more reads on this and writes on that. Yeah. Inference and training are two different things. You talk about reinforced learning, that's ongoing. Totally, yeah. That's going to have a different ratio of reads versus writes and compute requirements. So, right. And network path. You said VPCs, I'm going to send only these number. So yeah. you talk about that system's going to be completely flipped upside down. Right. What's yeah. your reaction to that? And, and how should people start thinking about this? Is it a mind blowing thing or it's reality, I think. Do you think it's reality? And, yeah. and if so, what do the people do? One of the most painful roles to be in right now is doing budgeting and planning for your <laughs> infrastructure <laughs> today at a large company because um, right now the, the challenge you have is you have all these different prototypes of generic applications and the roadmap for those carries you out maybe six months, maybe nine months, maybe 12 months, but there's a huge variability in you knowing when is this application going to get in production? What region of the world do I need to deploy this application in? What performance characteristics do I really need to have? Am I using a large model? Am I using a small model? The ML engineer told you I just don't know yet. I'm going to find out maybe a week before I deploy this which one of those is better. Um, that's a really challenging spot to be in. So one of the key reasons people use our Scale Gen AI platform is it's just really simple mm -hmm. to one click deploy that to all of your VPCs wherever they're located. You, they all operate under the same security principles, um, and then you're able to evaluate where you are in this roadmap mm -hmm. for each one of those applications and make those assumptions actually much more tangible. You know, would a small model fit here? Would it give me more reliable answers? Can I get 75% of the way to production just using that small model alone, or do I need to sometimes leverage a larger model to answer more complicated questions? Um, and then you can actually do budgeting and planning about where those GPUs mm -hmm. need to sit, um, what sort of top of rack configuration yeah. do you need? Hopefully you're on AWS and you're leveraging Bedrock and SageMaker, and so that, that's a little All bit. All right, so now we're at the, all right, thank you very much for a great conversation. Let's yeah. get into this, what you guys do with Amazon. Yeah. how they consume it. You're in the marketplace, I assume. Yep. What's the interaction? What's the relationship with Amazon? What's the coolest thing you're doing with AWS? Yeah, part of our announcement today, it's a multi-year strategic partnership with Amazon. So a lot of Amazon customers, they use Bedrock, use SageMaker today. A lot of them have asked for better evaluation of their models so they can assess whether a custom fine-tuned model is working here, whether a large model made from Anthropic or another provider is better suited for that application. Um, they can use our Gen AI application uh, and Gen AI platform and just one-click deploy to all of their VPCs. In Bedrock today? In Bedrock, yeah. Available to, uh, yeah. Yeah. instantly. Yeah, yeah. So, and everything's built through your AWS account, so you can use your AWS credits for there and, and help you with your budgeting and planning, hopefully, going forward, using the insights you have there. Um, but the, some of the decision makers that are, have been asking for this, one is folks that are coming into a chief AI ethics officer role or chief AI mm -hmm. officer role, they have a lot of questions over how do I responsibly deploy AI? How safe are the AI applications yeah. I have out can there? Can I explain it? Yeah, totally, yeah. Can I explain like why this cybersecurity incident happened against this chain application? And then it's you know something really serious. I leaked internal data, but I can't explain why it happened. Um, <laughs> that's a bad spot. 
to be in. So <laughs> having the access to the application on the marketplace today, I think that's going to really empower a lot of those stakeholders to, to do their work. You know, it's interesting. So software supply chain has been a conversation we've been having a lot on theCUBE. Mm -hmm. And for the first time on a keynote, I heard the words data supply chain. Yeah. Not in reference to lineage. Totally in reference to, okay, I got to start tracking the data coming in. Again, you talk about observability challenges. Yeah. Again, this is just another example. It's, it's a whole new wild, wild world. Yeah, totally. There are all sorts of attacks that could potentially come up through data in the worst case scenario. If you, and if you're a bank, you, know, you have all sorts of foreign governments that want to infiltrate your systems and get information out. So it's important to stay ahead of that. We do a lot of what's called red teaming, where we use mm -hmm. our platform and we try to think in the way a malicious state actor, maybe North mm -hmm. Korea, I won't <laughs> name other ones, but yeah, North <laughs> Korea is a good one, how they would go about hacking a generic application, what sort of changes in the prompting or other things would they do to try to get access to the internal data. Um, and then you stay ahead of the game. You yeah. really know. We actually, we spent time talking to the US government, we presented to the Homeland Security Committee on red teaming and what it really means. Yeah. Um, because it's important for the U.S. government to, to spread this knowledge, yeah. help protect sensitive data is important for all, all yeah. the markets. I mean, we, we were, pre were predicting a Cambrian explosion of Gen AI apps, the infrastructure, middleware, data, all has to be looked at yeah. and rethought through with a mindset of, Generate in mind, right? You got totally. it's, it's generating. Yeah. it's runtime. Totally. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We've seen this movie before in distributed computing. It's called the Edge, Tactical Edge. Yeah. BJ, if you could summarize your relationship with Amazon, the news, and and what you guys do, what would be the bumper sticker? What would be the um, the soundbite that you? think that the users should walk away with as, as, a, as a perception of what they want to take away. Yeah, the, the key part of the strategic partnership is it's really meeting customers where they are. You know, every customer is on this different journey towards adopting Gen AI. Some of them have successfully deployed prototypes in production. Others are really feeling bottlenecked by those trust and safety issues about how to get out there. So using our platform, it's an easy way to just get observability into where your data sits, how it's informing the answers yeah. you're getting out of Gen AI, and really what it's going to take to accelerate the adoption of this technology. Um, so we're hopeful that as part of this, yeah. customers don't just think that there's a one size fit all answer to Gen AI questions or like one single data architecture is going to work for everyone. Instead, it's what's the way to yeah. get the observability out, what's working today and what I need to invest in. in and you guys are going to fit right into the architecture, architecture of AWS and all the totally, higher yeah. level services. Yeah, BPCs, that, you know, the role-based access control you have in place, um, EKS, all these other technologies that, that financial services companies have used. We fit in very well with that and protecting it. But as CTO, what are some of the Amazon customers saying about this opportunity? Yeah, it's been huge. You know, our key customers right now have been financial services, healthcare, insurance, education. All of those businesses, they're just transforming. They're going to look very different five years from now than now. So anything you can do to get ahead of that, accelerate that transformation six months, yeah. nine months, <laughs> um, it's just... It's a land grab. I love this market. Yeah. BJ, thank you for coming on. Thank you. Thanks, John. All right. Yeah. Scale AI making the difference here, bring, changing the game on bedrock, bringing observability in. Again, the whole world's going to change. Reinforced learning right around the corner. Stay tuned for more coverage. We're bringing all the data here on theCUBE. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE. Thanks for watching. All right.